Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I'm Wurundjeri, not Wurundjeri. People get confused. Um, my country's in New South Wales. Uh, obviously, as a, as, and I quote the federal court, as a person who has fairer rather than dark skin, um, which is, I was one of the people in the Etoc and Bolt case. Um, and I think that's essentially why I can actually talk from an in insider's perspective as to not just why we did certain things within the case. And I also want to acknowledge that when I speak about the case, I'm only going to speak about my personal experiences with it. There were 18 others, there were nine other, uh, eight other people in the case, and I do not for one moment um, purport, to purport to speak on their behalf um, because everybody's experiences were quite dire. Uh, and that's the reason I suppose want to talk about why we did the things with, um, within the case that on the outside it looks like it was, you know, we should have done another, we should have used another mechanism of which to bring Andrew Bolt um, to heal, but that was never its purpose. The issue was how do non-Aboriginal people, what are the limits of the discussion about our very identity? What is the limits to that when Aboriginal peoples and communities and societies, we have already been through our own processes uh, to talk about our inclusion or exclusion? Um, so I, I want to be very clear that when I talk about my experiences with um, Andrew Bolt, uh, and I have a T-shirt that reads, I've been bolted. Uh, so uh, what was my experience of being bolted? And it means something. Um, I also want to acknowledge my mum. Uh, I got into trouble at the NA uh, when I received the NAIDOC award that I didn't publicly thank her uh, for, I suppose, giving birth. But um, <laughs> I want to, and my commitment after that was every time I get up in public, I will say, I love you, mum, thank you. Uh, but it's really important that I do pay respect to her because it was, it's through her that I can actually make my own sense of my Aboriginality and where I fit. Um, and she's been very um, giving in making sure that my perspectives in this talk today get realised. Um, and it, she's a very strong Wiradjuri woman. And my mother-in-law, Barb West, who is in Kahuna, um, and very dignified uh, non-Indigenous lady, farming background, and how I cherish the ability, uh, those interactions, because seeing uh, my Aboriginality through the lens of a strong uh, pastoralist woman is is something that I, I cherish because it gives me a perspective on myself uh, that I would never have had. And um, so I suppose we, sh we should jump in as to why you might have come along today. Um, I don't think I'm just that deadly that you wanted to come along. You probably actually want to know why we did what we did with the Andrew Bolt stuff. Um, what's its consequence? And there is a, delink, a direct link with the consequence of it to today, which is all the discussions about the repeal of 18C and 18D as an election promise and the discussion by the newly appointed Freedom Commissioner, uh, Tim Wilson, to the Australian Human Rights uh, Commission, are all related to the Andrew Bolt stuff. And it has been levelled at me and others that were subject to racial discrimination. Let's not forget, we didn't win a case. What we were is proved to be subject to discrimination. So it's not just about the positives that we actually had a, a victory, and it would be a pyrrhic and a very hollow victory, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but we were found to have been uh, racially discriminated against, and that's the issue. But um, the, the current discussion is uh, it's the responsibility now, and people are blaming us for the uncertainty of one of the human rights protections, which is the RDA itself, or the Racial Discrimination Act itself, which leads me to this weird so wait a minute, you're saying because we used human rights protections as a means of actually protecting how we um, are enjoying or actually exercising our human rights, um, that somehow that's now become our fault that it's uncertain because we don't want, you know, people shouldn't use the legislation to actually protect their rights because they're political statements. And, you know, that doesn't sit with me very well. 
because on the end of it, uh, discrimination means harm. And if there is no other mechanism in law to redress harm, we've actually got to start our, asking ourselves some fairly serious questions about what are we as a society and, you know, we could always have discussions about how majority of Australians think that asylum seekers should be treated and maybe that could be a barometer of where we're heading as a society, but that's for another day and certainly not here. Um, so a bit of background of this very real discussion about the concept of freedom and how it's almost an anathema to, to uh, anti-discrimination or that anti-discrimination is really the curtailment of the freedom of speech. That's essentially what is out there. That is what people are discussing. And I think uh, Professor Gillian Triggs, she, in a, a Guardian piece she wrote, she's the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, she wrote an article in January um, and that really brought this into focus. So, but what the media are focusing on is uh, the newly appointed commissioner, the, point, the issue about uh, freedom of speech, as well as then in order to achieve freedom of speech, we need to really think about that it's OK to discriminate against people in order to protect that. And Australia and the Australian Human Rights Commission has gone too far in making sure anti-discrimination, the law, as enacted by Parliament, um, is we're off tangent. Uh, but she said, um, responsibility, anti-discrimination laws, human rights and freedoms. These words have been at the centre of an ideological debate about how to protect fundamental freedoms, including freedom of speech, freedom of association and freedom of detention without trial. But if we are serious about securing these fundamental freedoms in Australian law, we must legislate to protect them just as we have done to protect us from discrimination. And I think therein lies the big problem, is that everybody is, or some commentators are saying that freedom of speech is, it is a, it's a freedom, but it actually hasn't assumed the protection in law through legislation. Australia has obligations to um, make sure that freedom of speech is legislated through um, us, uh, through Australia actually being a signatory and implementing parts of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But what Australia has done in law is say that discrimination is unlawful by passing legislation. And it's not just race, uh, sex, gender identity or ge uh, sexual orientation, age. They're all, they're all law. They're all statutes. They're all the way that the parliaments have gone around to make sure that discrimination is an attribute of society that is unlawful. It's not this concept, it's not a contest against freedom of speech or freedom of association. They're still all laws, but Australia hasn't gone to the effort for a, a, probably a variety of reasons of not making sure that those rights the freedoms, which are rights, are legislated for. So it's this dichotomy between freedom of speech and anti-discrimination, um, as I think uh, Professor um, Triggs points out, it, it's, a, it's a false debate. It is, it's just, to me, I can't understand. The law says it's unlawful to discriminate. The law also says that there are freedoms, right, the freedom of speech. That is a fundamental tenet of our society, built up over a lot of time. This is what the freedom of expression, freedom of speech, but it's not absolute. It never was, and nor should it be. Um, even the American, and I think this is what a lot of the understanding of Australians come in, is that it's modelled on this First Amendment of the US. We don't have it. We're not America, um, actually in some ways, thankfully so. Uh, I'm happy not to be. But for whatever reason, we're starting to import understandings of how we see our law with respect to American understandings. Freedom of speech is one of those issues. We don't have it, and we never will have it, because there, even in America, there is no absolute right to freedom of speech at law. It's the Bill of Rights, so it, it puts freedom of speech in a rights framework. So let's jump back into Australia. Where does it fit within our fri rights framework? Well, it is there. There is obligation. It's a tenant of our democracy that everybody can say 
what it is you like to say, but there's a relationship then with other rights, which is, I am not stopping you saying what it is you want to say, but there are laws that says, if what you say harms somebody else, then there's a limit. That's all anti-discrimination is. It's not this, we're trumping everything else, you can't say things, it is being mindful of what you are saying because on the other side of discrimination, as I've suggested, is harm. You know, you don't actually mount an anti-discrimination matter before a court or a tribunal suggesting, yeah, what they said was really beneficial. You've actually got to show that there was harm and it is on you to show that there is harm done to you. And, you know, that's, I have no problem as a lawyer. I think that's fine. Uh, and as a citizen, I think that's fine. You've got to be able to express how it hurts you or how it harms you. Some of it will be patently, obviously. There's obviously physical and emotional costs to um, harm. Not so much reputational costs, and I'll come back to that because that was the direction that people wanted us to take with Andrew Bolt. Why didn't you just sue him for defamation? Well, he didn't defame us. Aboriginality is not a reputation worth protecting. It's not a reputation. It is who you are. It is part of you. And on the basis of understanding that, the law has said in Australia and internationally, what we don't do is then use that attribute that is not, again, not a reputation, um, to actually say things that are going to harm you on the basis of that attribute. So, you know, back to <laughs> it's not a reputation. So what is Aboriginality? And I think that's really important for here. And why is, why is the Racial Discrimination Act the most important protection that we all have? I mean, it's not fanciful to say that whiteness could also be caught in anti-discrimination law. If a group of black fellas are going after you just because you're white and on the basis of that, you know, all of that sort of stuff, there, it's not impossible to imagine where that could take. So this notion from non-Indigenous people, or sorry, non-white people, because I think the public discussions um, and certainly the public support for the non-amendment to the Racial Discrimination Act is coming from religious um, uh, quarters. It's also coming from uh, the, you know, there's a whole raft of otherness that is saying, please don't tinker with the Race Discrimination Act because it's not just about race. It's about colour, national or ethnic origin or religion is caught in race or the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, so the attributes that of indigeneity that is worth protecting is exactly the reason we did not go after Andrew Bolt uh, through defamation laws. And also one of the uh, defences in defamation and under the RDA is public interest. And one of those issues that was raised was just because there is there's issues about Aboriginal, Aboriginality in the public arena does not make it of itself public interest. You know, that, and that's a defence. If it's in the public interest, Tanya Plibersek was on, um, I think it was Q&A a couple of weeks ago and says, just because something is in the public does not mean it's in the public interest to actually have these discussions. And what we have with Indigenous identity, it's, it's trapped in how society has dealt with us as Aboriginal people, inferiority, superiority, the stolen generations, the removal policies f that resulted in stolen generations. That was based on social understandings of indigeneity of which then could be manipulated. The legal test, but what never went away was that how Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, we actually still maintain our own sense of identity vis-a-vis -vis or amongst each other. That never went away. But that's not the realm that we're talking about. We're talking about how outsiders now think, or through history, have not only thought that they could be able to engage with Aboriginal people and their existences and our existences, uh, but 
do things uh, to those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that the end result is there would be none. Um, and so what we have now in this new concept of Aboriginality, which was at the heart of um, Andrew Bolt's attack on successful, fair-skinned Aboriginal people, which then draws you into what he's really saying is if you're not black and you are needy, that's his definition of Aboriginality. And because those people he went after didn't actually accord with his version of Aboriginality, then we were imposters. We were identifying for a lot of other reasons other than it's just because who we are. It's the way we were, what we were born into. We can't help that as much as anybody can be born into anything. I mean, I was born in being a gay person. That, you know, I didn't have any control over that and I didn't have any control over my Aboriginality. What I do find interesting is that when, uh, when Andrew Bolt was asking me, well, basically outed me, he didn't want proof that I was gay, but he wanted proof of my Aboriginality. So it's like, am I that gay? That, that there is no proof required. But you see what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is when people start to actually say, I, I can recognise an attribute that then I want proof. Because of my fair skin, and I'm not stupid, and I'm certainly not uh, visually impaired, I know what I look like. But I, what I don't look like is a stereotype that is forced from outside onto me. And that's my challenge every day, is overcoming somebody else's stereotype, uh, which is I might not look um, particularly dark. Uh, you know, I have relatives, relatives with, who are very black in that stereotype. And I also have cousins that are redheads in the sort of Ronald McDonald type. Uh, so, but what we all have in common is our Aboriginality because that's our family. All blind genetics, but it's that construction of Aboriginality that has morphed over time to legally what have we got today? Who knows that there is a three-point test for Aboriginality? Yeah. There is a test. There is a legal test, which I implore you to not say that that's what Aboriginal people think when um, we're engaging with each other. We don't, we don't ask each other, well, are you legally an Aboriginal person? Um, mainstream society is tending to ask uh, what is an legally an Aboriginal person. And there has been through case law and statutes uh, definitions. But when you have legislative definitions, you know, we're also then caught in history because it was on the basis of legislative definitions. Uh, who's heard of half-caste, octoroon, quadroon? They were all based in legislative attempts to define Aboriginal, a, Aboriginality for the purpose of eradicating it. So the smaller your blood quantum, the further you moved away from Aboriginal and you would be white. And uh, let's face it, up until the 1960s, I really mean white. Uh, we had the white Australia policy. We had basically determina determinants of whiteness that excluded everything else. So I'm not just being glib when I say when these removal policies and these legislative attempts to define Aboriginality. And Victoria, surprisingly, was um, the first place in the world that sort of started the apartheid movement um, with uh, the Half-Caste Act of 1885. So that was, it was a legislative attempt to actually put down blackness and promote whiteness um, in law. And what we have now is the, the historic remnants or the remnants of that understanding. And so when legislation um, has moved, but has moved, there's been a paradigm shift in who gets to determine. It's not on your blood quantum, um, thank goodness, because uh, I don't do fractions, because so I imagine how crap I'd be at trying to work that one out. Um, I think, no, I won't, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but um, we have, the, the legal test is you've got to have biological descent. What does that mean? Well, it, it's problematic, because basically there is no, the, um, the Australian Law Reform Commission did a huge genome project in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, one of the, there is no physical or genetic marker for Aboriginality. There is no gen genetic marker for race. 
Um, so what is it? What is a biological connection? What is the biological? Basically, we're relying on the colonial record. Somewhere, if you have an ancestor that was deemed to be Aboriginal, you can track it. Because essentially, that's, a, that's what it is. And everybody's comfortable with that. Because essentially, if it, one of the things that um, the, the, uh, the colonials were good at was record keeping about how to eradicate Aboriginal people. <laughs> so, you know, the, re the colonial record is strong, uh, but, you know, th that it's not without consequence. So, um, it's easy to jump into, well, the, the, the test is um, biological descent. Well, we have to be clear what biological descent is. You've just got to be descended from some person um, that is on the colonial record at some point. Um, the, uh, the second is you've got to identify as an Aboriginal person. And up until the 80s, when, when there really was a, a, that paradigm shift, Aboriginal people denied their Aboriginality for good reason. On the basis of the way you looked and identified, you could be taken. You know, it's not fanciful. And this is in my mum's generation. This is in my generation. So these things about identity, and it's also feeling safe to identify what it means. So this explosion that right-wing nutjobs talk about, that there's so many Aboriginal people now because we're all on the gravy train. A, I don't like gravy, and I like train travel, but um, I don't understand where the gravy train is because the assumption is, you know, all home loans, we all get free home loans, which if there's a loan, it's sort of, they're not free, then they're a grant. So uh, that's a sort of, I don't get that. We drive big cars and we get free petrol. No, no, and no, nothing. So, and I actually want to ask, why, where is the benefit in saying you're Aboriginal? But that will go back to this concept of need and the way that Aboriginal people, to be true Aboriginal people, are needy. They require intervention but well that's a terrible word they require some sort of engagement with the state to overcome the deficiencies or to access opportunities therefore needy um, I'm, I won't go there so the test is now you've got to self-identify and there's a safety element to that and I think that's a really good movement forward the third which is the most contentious amongst Aboriginal people is You've got to have evidence of community acceptance of you as an Aboriginal person. Ironically, the way that you actually do this now is you get a piece of paper with the common seal of a sort of very abstract, nebulous, white concept of a corporation to stamp you uh, on your piece of paper. Yes, they accept you. Um, so for legal purposes, done. But it, it's also there's also a backlash to that. So th there is a test and it is used. It is used administratively by governments to be assured that the people who are accessing benefits are truly deserving. I mean, I think there's some places we can go with that. The other is um, Aboriginal organisations and legislation like the Native Title Act, uh, the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in New South Wales have these, you can only be a member if you're Aboriginal of a land council which is that definition. So it comes through in different ways, but it is there and it is used. But like I've said to many people, that, that's for legal purposes, I tick all those boxes, but that's not of interest to me. What is of interest is how do other black fellas see me? How does my own community, how does my own nation see me? Which has got nothing to do with that test. Who's heard the, who's your mob, where you're from? Yeah, that's the black way. That's where you connect yourself in. And believe me, there is so much structure around knowing who you are. And there is always the extremities. What about the stolen gens people? Well, you know, what is going on with the stolen generations people, as despairing as it is, is it's not denying their Aboriginality because the only reason they are part of the stolen generations is what? they were identified as being Aboriginal, of which only part, which was then the removal. So just by being stolen generations, you've got Aboriginality. Um, the despair comes in in how, do we, how, how does the Aboriginal community and those stolen generations' families reconnect? And that will take some time, and rightfully so. So I'm getting close to the end. So Andrew Bolt. Right. 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act said it is unlawful for anybody to offend 
insult, humiliate or intimidate. Offend and insult seems to be what gets people upset right now. Uh, the case and that's the bar is set too low. It is not just a matter of being merely offended. Andrew Bolt wrote scurrilous, inaccurate, de demeaning and damaging um, stuff about us in the press. By his own admission, he is read or syndicated to four to five million Australians every day. That's a lot of influence, of which his suggestion was, um, and I quote, he referred to me as a gay white man masquerading as a black woman, no, a gay white man with a law degree masquerading as a black woman with my snout in the trough. Um, so, you know, where? What the hell? Uh, and the issue with that isn't so much that I was offended. It was, what's the effect of that kind of rhetoric on people's willingness, ability, and especially vulnerable people, vulnerable Aboriginal people who are, and you know, the court got to there, about what it, how you even identify. If that's what's going to be levelled at you, would you actually go down that path? So, you know, and what he said about the others is just as scurrilous and just as inaccurate. We all know that we would have won defamation. Um, those of us in the group that were lawyers were positive, but that wasn't the issue of why the Racial Discrimination Act was the appropriate mechanism, because he went after Aboriginal people, not us as individuals. We were the litmus test of his he could not identify his Aboriginality in, an, in us, and therefore he attacked Aboriginality as being, you cannot be successful, whatever that's meant to be. Because look at who he went after. I mean, it wasn't just, and without investigating any of our personal histories, where we've come from, his marker of success was, as soon as you get a certain level, then you are impacting other people's neediness and you are not Aboriginal. That's essentially what the argument was put forward. Um, he also, his team ran the argument that political communication and public interest, just because Aboriginality is also not a political status. It is where people, that people, other people think it's okay to talk about in the abstract, as men do about women, as Straight people talk about gay people and lesbians and bi and trans and, uh, transgendered and intersex. When you are, it's not an abstraction. We are people and this is the mechanism of which we are protecting our right to live with dignity and equality. So what Bolt was saying was he couldn't recognise anything of the way he sees Aboriginality in this group that were fairer rather than darker. And this is what Andrew, the judge, was on. So we didn't go defamation. We went because this was protecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from incursions into our very essence. Because there is effects when people, not just us that were harmed, there are effects on allowing that level of re revolting speech to influence others to share that view. And therefore, in, others start to impede our ability to live with equality and dignity. So the effects of it, but more so the biggest issue was the future. We didn't do it. We're all fairly strong people. Do you think we don't look the way that we do and think, and we, and we all existed very publicly, so we kind of knew who we were. You think we, that would have been ground level, be certain of who you are before you go public, we, existing as an Aboriginal person, looking not a stereotype. Um, but it was the future generations. I have a son who is as fair as me, but he is also as Aboriginal as me. And I know a lot of his friends are in the same situation. Andrew Bolt was found to intimidate people out of mere identity of itself. That is why we went after him. And that is why the court said this was actually dangerous. And there is a defence, public interest. He didn't even get near it because it's not in the public interest the way he went about his so-called journalism. Anyway, I'm out of time, but that's where we're at. Thank you.